podcast is now starting. All attendees. Uh, good morning. I'm trying to show this. All right. Do you guys see the 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 uh, the title page? Yes. Crate Myrtle Bark Scale Number Three Beneficials. Uh, and on the screen, I think the participants can see. Uh, I don't. I don't get to see you since now I'm showing the full screen. Uh, see myself. Uh, I'm gonna raise my hand. Uh, Rodrigo. Rodrigo, raise your hand. When I when I name uh, call your name, raise your hand. Uh, uh, our three presenters today. Uh, it's gonna be uh, Kyle. Kyle Gilder. Kyle. Um, Kenneth. Uh, David. Dr. David Held from uh, Auburn University. Dr. Hongming from uh, from biology department. Uh, Dr. Hongming is a collaborator on the uh, on the project. And Air Fong. All right. Uh, did I mention everyone? Rodrigo, did I mention your name? Yes. I did. You, okay. You didn't right. mention Dr. Hines. Dr. Hines is very shy. He's not showing his face, so uh, we're just gonna oh, ignore he is, him. He's there. He's there. Uh, I can see it. Yeah. <laughs> I can see it. Oh. Yeah, yeah, we can see his face now. Okay, all right, Dr. Hines. Dr. Hines is the advisor uh, for uh, uh, Kyle and Kenneth. So I just want to remind you that a lot of information are on this uh, website, stopcmbs.com, that uh, Airfang is doing a great job managing this uh, webpage. We have a lot of resources and, you know, and, and information like the webinars. You know the uh, the incoming webinars and and the recording of the webinars. So uh, so uh, definitely check this out. And if you see crate myrtle bark scale in your neck of the wood, you know report it report it here. Um, so help us uh, attract these. And recently I just got an email from New York. Uh, you know one of the uh, citizen scientists uh, submitted a photo. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, it was not crate myrtle bark scale. It was actually one of the beneficials. So I just want to say that you know we are very thankful that this work is partially supported by the uh, what well, used to be uh, it was originally um, supported by Crop Protection and Pest Management Project, uh, and then later on it was supported by Specialty Crop Research Initiative uh, working on crate myrtle bark scale. I think I forgot uh, Daryl. I think Daryl, are you still there, Daryl? Dr. Daryl Harp. Okay, Dr. Daryl Harp. From uh, Texas uh, A&M uh, Commerce Campus. Oh, I think I mentioned everyone now. Okay, um, some of the team members here, uh, more here, um, and uh, you see that uh, these these group are the uh, major uh, players in today's uh, webinar. They're working on the beneficials and the impact on the beneficials. Uh, additional uh, funding. Uh, you know, partners on this uh, on this project, working on uh, you know, give us uh, seed money for uh, cr you know the project managing crate myrtle bark scale. I want to share uh, two very good news. This would be considered as the outcome of our uh, project. One is one of the presenters, well, two of the presenters today, Kyle and Kenneth. Uh, they're the uh, the first and second author on this paper and. This was just out today. Well, June June the 29th, if you see that. Oh 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 oh. Mm -hmm. Too fast. So uh, Kyle just published a paper on Journal of Hymenoptera. Am I saying it right? Hymenoptera: A Discovery of uh, Non-Native Parasitoids. I'm not going to try the scientific name, and it's non-native host. Blah 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 in Central Texas. So uh, so congratulations, Kyle and Kenneth and Kevin. And also, um, we have uh, not long before that, uh, my student, Ron Chi and Bing, uh, just published a uh, paper, Feeding Preference of Crate Myrtle Bark Scale on different species, on different plant species. So a lot of plant species uh, which kind of confirmed uh, some of the uh, the uh, alternative host status and and quantified quantified the uh, the damage on these uh, plants. So with that, uh, I'm going to change uh, to presenter 
Number one, Mr. Yes. Got my screen up? Yes. Go ahead, Kyle. Excellent. Looks good. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, my name is Kyle Giller from the Heinz Lab. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about criminal park scale and the criminal ecosystem in Texas, with a focus on uh, CMBS and its native natural enemies. So, so, ecosystem surveys are often a logical first step in biological control programs. As of yet, no one has uh, carried out a methodical season-by-season -season survey of the Crete Merle ecosystem. Intensive sampling of the organisms living on Crete Merle is required for such a survey. So, to do that, we need some intensive sampling. Sampling took place in Brazos County and Tarrant County, around 190 kilometers apart over the course of six consecutive seasons. 100 plants in each county, 10 branches each were sampled. Sample sizes were established from preliminary sampling in 20, fall of 2017. 40 trees of the Natchez cultivar and 60 of various unknown cultivars. Uh, we divide those into two separate groups because there are over 200 great more cultivars and identifying them in the field is difficult to say the least, but we knew we could identify Natchez. It's very distinctive. Trees in residential areas were avoided to minimize variation in care and to avoid permission hassles. So we collected at least 150 arthropod species I say at least because some um, immature insects in uh, arachnids are very difficult to identify. These pictures were taken by me, uh, the various insects and arachnids collected. This is not comprehensive and I only use pictures I have taken so I wouldn't have to clutter up the slide with attributions. Uh, the trees sampled were host to an incredible diversity of insects, spiders, and other small organisms. 16 lady beetles were collected. Six of those are um, scale specialists. Axion plagiatum, Chalicorus cacti, Chalicorus stigma, Exocomus marginipennis, Hyperaspis by geminata, and Hyperaspis lateralis. Chalicorus cacti was the most commonly collected be lady beetle. And like CMBS, it was also collected year round. Uh, what are these lady beetles? You might be asking, what do they look like? Well, I'll tell you. So we have three uh, Chalicornae here, scale-eating lady beetles, Chalicorus cacti, Chalicorus stigma, and Axion plagiatum. And these uh, Chalicorus cacti is a Western species. Well, I mean, a Southwestern species, Chalicorus stigma, occurs everywhere east of the Rocky Mountains. Axion plagiatum, also a Western species. Uh, the easiest way to tell these apart, and it is hard to tell them apart because across the ranges, these red spots they have are all going to be look, kind of have variations to them that kind of look alike. So an easy way to tell them apart is to flip them over and look at the underside of them, and you'll see that Chalicorus cacti, except for the legs, has an orange underside all over. Chalicorus stigma has an upper half that is black and a lower half that is orange, and Axion plagiatum has this black line going down the middle of it. Axiom plagiatum uh, is also a little bit larger. More CMBS eating lady beetles. We have Hyperaspis lateralis, which in its immature form looks like this little ball of fluff. It has four spots. It has these little lines that give it its name on the sides here. Hyperaspis by Geminata has these little bumpers, these little red bumpers on each side of it. Four of those. Again, looks kind of like a scale. We have Exocomus marginipennis. This is actually a picture of the larva of the close related uh, Exocomus trigenae because apparently no one has any pictures of Exocomus marginipennis larva. I looked at larva other beetles in the genus and they all look similar to this though. So you'll notice it looks kind of like uh, our Chalicorus stigma, Chalicorus cacti, and plagiatum. These are all in the same subfamily, Chalicorinae, which are scalating lady beetles. So moving on to the other lady beetles. Harmonia axiritis, the Asian multicolored lady beetle, was also a relatively common collection. It is a non-native -gen generalist. It eats scales, but there's also other small insects, and sometimes the larvae of other beneficial insects. Other lady beetles collected may, or such as Coccinella symptom punctata, Cyclinia munda, Hippodamia convergens, 
Olivia nigrum and the two consumed species we collected may or may not consume criminal bark scale. The scientific literature is spotty in regards to scale of consumption for these species. They do all eat aphids and other pests though, so they're generally good to have around. Two species of labials collected, very unlikely that they eat a uh, scale, Silobora renifer and Silobora baginta maculata. They actually eat fungus and not predators at all. However, they do eat powdery mildew, so they're also doing their best to help create myrtle growers. Other predators we have are lace wings, Chrysopidae and Hemorrhoidae, and pirate bugs, family Anthocoridae. These were also commonly collected and are similar to HIV pseudoritis in their dietary preferences. There are records of scientific literature that meaning scale insects in addition to many other pest insects. Spiders were the most common predators found, but they eat just about whatever they catch within certain size ranges. So I didn't actually make a slide for those. Uh, collection highlights for other herbivores. We have our crepe myrtle aphids and our thrips. These were the most common pest species other than CMBS on crepe myrtles. Bark lice and herbivorous mites were also commonly collected. These arthropods do not actually eat crepe myrtles, but things growing on crepe myrtles like algae or fungus. Small organisms like thrips, aphids, and mites provide resources for generalist predators. Ants were also frequently collected on crepe myrtles. Their relationship to CMBS is unclear at the moment. Ants are known to protect honeydew producing insects, such as scales and aphids, thereby interfering with natural enemies but sometimes they also consume these honeydew producing insects. Should be emphasized that we did collect parasoid wasps. You saw Dr. Gu giving me um, congratulations for that paper, uh, but we didn't collect any parasoid wasps with Kramer bark scale. Kenton and I did, so we got a paper out of it, but we found no CMBS parasitoids. So I'm gonna go over some highlights for location. In total, more CMBS were collected in Brazos than Tarrant County. Brazos, the same scale predator species were present in both locations. Herbivore numbers were a bit different. Tarrant had more thrips and aphids. Brazos had more non-predatory mites. Predator numbers also differed a little bit by location. Tarrant had more predatory mites, camera B and fidelity. Might be the reason it has fewer non-predatory mites because predatory mites generally eat non-predatory mites. Tarrant County had more pirate bugs and chrysopids. Tarrant County also had more thrifts and aphids. So for the season highlights, CMBS numbers were highest in the spring with the exception of Tarrant County in 2019 when CMBS numbers were highest in the summer. CMBS natural enemy numbers were also highest in the spring. And, but again, Tarrant County was an exception in 2019 when scale predator numbers were highest in the summer. Tarrant County has a tendency to scale for, to spray for West Nile virus. So I need to go through some old episodes, of, I mean, some old uh, editions of Star Telegram and see when they were spraying for West Nile virus. Maybe that could provide an explanation for that. So we have some collection highlights for cultivar. Proportionally, there were more CMBS on Natchez and Brazos County. Oddly, there were proportionally fewer on Natchez and Tarrant County samples. So six seasons, 20, 12,000, 30 similar long branch tips later, we had a mountain of collection data and we wanted to make it easier to digest. So food webs function as maps describing interspecific relationships among organisms with the community. Food web also serves as a resource for future classical biological control programs. Arthropod predators such as coccinellids and chrysopids may be obstacles to any parasitoid species introduced as a control measure. So we see down here, we have a simple food web centered around a tree, it might be a spruce. The squirrel gets food from the tree and is turned eaten by foxes and snakes. We wanted our food web to be more insect focused, obviously. So when constructing a food web, we use the arthropod collections as a single food web was constructed with a single exception, the common organisms collected and featured in the food web were identical between Tarrant County and Brazos County. This also applied between seasons and cultivars. The links between arthropods were constructed using existing scientific literature about, about the arthropods collected, the spiders, the insects, everything else. We had a bristly millipede in there, but we didn't include that in the food web. The food web design is based on a layout used by Hudson et al. in 2013. 
and this is our food web. So the bottom row is freight myrtles, like extremely species polaris, that's gonna be number one. Middle row, two through eight, is our herbivores. Top row, nine through 27, is our predators. Arrows indicate that a particular organism is consuming, let's see if I can get my arrow, there it is. It's consuming a particular organism. Intergeal predation is also present. Some predators will eat other predators. These can be the elbowed arrows, arrows with the corners here, leading from one predator to another. Mutualism is also present, or maybe, depending on how the ants are behaving. These are represented by lines without arrows. So you can see that leading from our ants, 19, 20, and 21, to our hemipterms that produce honeydew. Yes, no way, that's a thrip. Sorry. Uh, the orange note is the mite family Camarabiidae. This was unique to Tarrant County collections. Some research indicates that niche saturation, in other words, a lot of insects doing the same particular job in a uh, ecosystem, makes food webs resistant to invasion by non-native species. So this might mean that introducing another lady beetle scare predator for biological control would be problematic since we have so many scale eating predators, lady beetles especially. Predators such as coccinellids and chrysopids, which were relatively common predators in the study, may also be obstacles to any parasitoid species introduced as a control measure. Again, no parasitoid wasp with CMBS were collected, which also could mean there is likely a niche available for a CMBS parasitoid though it might face incidental predation from other CMBS predators. Further studies of non-native parasitic wasps are needed, which is what Kenneth is doing in the next presentation. To summarize, we have lots of beneficial insects and crave minerals, but despite this, uh, satisfactory control of CMBS has not yet been achieved. Our hope is that this uh, food web and our ecosystem work is, will be a foundation for future research and control methods, such as importation biological control. I'd like to acknowledge USDA NEFA, Texas A&M AgriLife, and a whole host of other people that were extraordinarily helpful to me for this study. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Kyle. Our next speaker is uh, Kenneth. Kenneth, can you show your screen? Yes, I can. Is it, uh, is it visible? Yes. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Gu, for putting this together and having us um, talk to you. I'm really excited to present. Um, and I want to thank Kyle for that um, part one of this beneficials talk here. Um, as Kyle mentioned, um, the native natural enemies that are here in uh, Texas are not really be have not been able to suppress the great myrtle bark scale populations as such. And Kyle also mentioned that there are no known parasitoids that he has found in his samples, this really extensive, exhaustive sampling of um, beneficials. So um, additional to that is that there are no currently known parasitoids of CMBS anywhere in the United States. So um, I wanted to first take a little bit of a step back and just kind of define what a parasitoid is for those who maybe aren't too familiar. So if we look at this picture from uh, a really a fun cool website, buzzhootroar.com. This orange wasp here is a parasitoid. It is laying its egg into an aphid. That egg develops into a larva, um, which is orange here. And that larva develops into adult, uh, killing the aphid. There's also this green wasp here, which is a hyperparasitoid. It's a parasitoid of a parasitoid. So it lays its egg in the larva of the parasitoid. Let me find my mouse here. And that larva develops in the parasitoid wasp and ultimately comes out uh, killing the original parasitoid. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about parasitoids and hyperparasitoids, so I just wanted to define those. A lot of this stuff happens kind of under our nose without us seeing it, they're typically very small. And so one that, uh, an example, just to sort of illustrate, um, the, an example that you might be familiar with and see a lot of are these uh, cicada killers. They are a little bit different in that they lay their eggs in burrows and then provision their nests with cicadas, but those um, larvae do feed on the cicada and um, uh, ultimately kill it, um, which is similar in fashion to a parasitoid loss. I also want to define importation biological control as that is the focus of my um, research. 
Um, the intentional introduction of an exotic biological control agent for permanent establishment and long-term pest control. Um, so if we look at that another way, so we have China and we have the Great Myrtle Bark Scale in its native range, and it has its complement of natural enemies, a parasitoid and a lady beetles, parasitoid wasps. But when that insect, the bark scale, moves to a new range like the United States, it doesn't have that same complement of natural enemies with it. So it's able to reproduce and spread. And so the idea is connecting these natural enemies, one or a couple of these natural enemies, back with the pest in this new range. But to do that requires a lot of testing, and I'm going to explain sort of the process uh, as we go forward. As of 2010, I just wanted to point out that over 6,100 introductions of natural enemies um, have been made against 588 different pests. About a third of those pests were controlled, and 55% of those introductions were made against pests of woody plants. So there is precedent used, uh, precedent for this uh, method used in a uh, a system similar to that of Great Myrtle Bark Scale. An example would be the giant white fly on street trees. So trees, you know, uh, basically in uh, non uh, non residential areas, shade trees, and things along the sides of roads and, and decorative trees like that. Um, so the giant white fly is from Mexico, and it was causing some problems with these kinds of trees, um, similar to those that the Great Myrtle Bark Sale causes um, in California. And so some researchers went out, explored Mexico, and found a couple of parasitoids that were then brought back and introduced to um, control the giant white fly successfully. Um, so that's just an example of this working in a system that's similar to ours that we're talking about here. So these are the steps that we've kind of split the process of um, importation uh, into identifying and collecting candidate natural enemies um, by exploring the pest native home range, importing those through quarantine, performing experiments to determine how specific, um, how specific those candidate natural enemies are, and then using all of those results and informing a petition for a field release. And we'll go into each one of these individually, starting with the first one here. What we did before we started getting collections of um, scales and wasps from China is we looked into the literature to see, okay, what, um, what is being, uh, what is a natural enemy that uh, uses great myrtle bark scale as a host? What parasitoids use great myrtle bark scale as a host? So we found a list of 18 different parasitoid wasps. Most of these are from China, two are from India, and one is from Korea, uh, South Korea. And um, so this gave us some, some information of what to expect when we started getting materials sent to us from China. Um, okay, so you know we have here Metaphycus is the most common genus reported using Great Myrtle Bark Scale as a host. So then we can expect that we will likely receive Metaphycus wasp when we start collecting um, scale material and wasp material from China. This is just a, a sort of a pre uh, preamble to what we could expect um, finding uh, natural enemy wise and parasitoid wise being used in China. So now we are importing these natural enemies through quarantine. And this is where um, I have to definitely thank Dr. Hu for getting us in touch with Dr. Juan Shi from Beijing Forestry University, who then got us in touch with Liu Yang, their graduate student. And both Dr. Gu and Liu got us in touch with this really great network of amazing volunteers to make collections of scales for us and send them to us. So they would collect scale um, from crepe myrtle trees just in the, on, you know, along the street or wherever in their cities in China, clip them, send them to us through, uh, and, and uh, through our quarantine lab. And then we would look and observe those twigs for any uh, wasps that emerged. We would look at these twice a day every day. Um, I need to point out that not only was this um, getting everybody on the same page was a little bit challenging. There's a, a lot of moving parts. Um, and sometimes there are things sort of beyond our control in terms of if moisture gets into the shipping device and um, 
mold accumulated on the twigs and you couldn't really use those twigs or if the twigs were not the appropriate size, you know, um, that was challenging, um, but ultimately rewarding to, to get everybody on the same page and to spend the time doing that. And then also, um, I need to point out that both exporting the twigs from China required a permit and then importing them into the United States required a separate permit from AFIS. The importation permit is from AFIS, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Services. Um, and uh, additionally, when they send them to us, they send them to our quarantine lab. And that quarantine lab is a federally, federally approved oversought by AFIS. Um, so uh, a lot, there's a lot of sort of red tape and bureaucracy that goes into um, getting these samples from China. So it's not just a matter of coordinating everybody, but then also doing the appropriate permitting process. I just wanted to point out that um, this is a really difficult step and really great um, that we were able to collaborate with everybody that we were able to collaborate, excuse me, collaborate with. So ultimately we received shipments from 10 cities listed here on this map. 146 total parasitoids were collected from seven species. 118 of those parasitoids were primary parasitoids, so the ones that use the scale as the host, and then 28 of those were hyperparasitoids, the ones that use the parasitoids of the scale as a host. Unfortunately, we were not able to rear these in the lab. Um, there was ultimately the goal was to get a colony of these going in the lab so that we could then pull from that colony to use in these experiments um, that we wanted to, uh, to run. But unfortunately, there, you know, there's a number of reasons this could be the case, but um, ultimately we weren't able to get them in the lab, weird in the lab. I'd like to point out that um, the, where we got them from in China, not only is it where the folks that um, were uh, collecting for us were able to go and collect for us, but also um, we wanted to make sure that the environment that we would be introducing these wasps into was similar to their environment in their native range. So this is a map from Climax software. And what that does is it takes, allows you to take the weather from one city and compare it to the climate of many different cities around the world. So this is looking at the comparison between Houston, which was the closest Texas city to College Station, with the software package and comparing it to um, cities in Asia. The darker the square, each square represents a city or town, and the darker the square, the more black it is, the more similar the climate is. So just wanted to point out that the cities that we collected these, um, or that had these wasps and scales collected for us, um, those were similar in climate to, um, to Texas. Um, and the, the point is not only do we want them to be able to, you know, at least live where we introduce them, but also to, to function as a parasitoid and appropriately um, develop and, and have sort of the normal behavior that it would normally have. And lastly, uh, for this particular portion, I just wanted to demonstrate that different cities had different proportions of primary and hyperparasitoids. So this informs where we would like to um, make future collections in cities that had a greater proportion of primary parasitoids, because we're looking for primary parasitoids that use the scale as the host and not hyperparasitoids that use um, uh, the scale parasitoids as hosts. So Taiyan, Jinning, Liang Yungang, and Hangzhou are all places where we'd like to focus our future collection efforts. As I mentioned, there were seven species that we collected. Two were hyperparasitoids, uh, excuse me, primary parasitoids, and five were hyperparasitoids. The primary parasitoids are really um, what we're interested in, and I want to make a make sure that I acknowledge Dr. Woolley, James Woolley, um, for taking these pictures and for identifying all of these wasps. Um, so we received Metaphycus, a genus of Metaphycus, and a genus of um, a species of Moranilla. So metaphycus is what we call a larval endoparasitoid. So it focuses on these immature stages of the scale, lays eggs inside of them, and those larvae develop inside the, the immature scales. Um, and then Moranilla is very unique in that it lays its eggs sort of on, under, or near adult females, and then the larvae hatch and they actually eat the eggs. So they're egg predators. Um, 
this is really great and promising too, because um, not only are these you know um, interesting and unique ways of, of feeding, but they complement each other. So there won't be really, there likely won't be as much competition as if they were two species that did the same kind of feeding um, and had the same sort of behavior uh, in parasitic behavior. Uh, so this is promising and hopefully we'll be able to get more of these wasps and, and test them together in that regard. So now we want to talk about performing experiments to determine how host specific um, each wasp or candidate wasp might be. And to do that, I want to take a little step back and just talk about plant volatiles for a second. Uh, so plants are constantly producing smells um, all the time. And when they're fed on by an herbivore, like this caterpillar in this depiction here, they release different smells. And those different smells um, you recruit natural enemies, parasitoids and predators to the plant to then help defend them against the herbivore. What we wanted to do is see, because nobody has done this with crepe myrtle yet, what kind of odors are the crepe myrtle plants producing on their own? And then what kind of odors are they producing in response to being fed on by the scale? And will those odors then be specific enough that the wasp will use those as a cue to find its host, the scale. So first, what we did was we set up um, this setup seen here in this picture to collect uh, volatiles from crepe myrtle plants, potted crepe myrtle plants. Um, and we wanted to see, like I said, what the volatiles that were released um, were in uninfested plants and then those infested with scale. And as we can see, um, those plants infested with scale produced greater amounts of these four volatiles, trans-beta osamine, E-alpha-farnazine, Z-alpha-farnazine, and methyl salicylate. And these are important because in the literature, they're identified as um, important recruiters of natural enemies to plants. So this preliminary work is showing us that, yes, in fact, these plants do, like other plants, produce volatiles in response to feeding from herbivores. And then we wanted to test how those volatiles um, interacted with, with wasps that we were able to collect. Um, so we used this setup here. This is a, a, a machine a, a instrument called the Y2 bolt factometer. What it does is it gives you, it gives basically wasps a choice. Um, you have two chambers here where you can put two sources of an odor, connect those up to this tube here. Um, put the wasps at the base of the tube and then give them some time to make a choice to go into one arm or the other. And that arm is associated with one of the odor sources. And what we were able to find so far anyway was that, in fact, the wasps were able to identify infested crate myrtle plants. Um, but uh, uh, beyond that, we needed some more testing and have them to, to understand how they would really interact with infested versus uninfested crepe myrtle plants, and then crepe myrtle plants versus other non-host plants. So some more work needs to be done here, and um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So lastly, I want to talk about using these results to inform a petition for field release. This is just an example here on the right of proposed um, release of for parasites of the airman ash borer. This is just what sort of the cover page would look like. But basically what you do is you take all of the work that you've done write it up into an environmental assessment. Those assessments are made available for review to the public, uh, review and for public comment, and then um, it's assessed whether or not there is a need to release what you're proposing to release. Once you release it, you then should do post-release studies to make sure that what you released is actually doing what you think it should and want it to. So um, the permitting process is, I point this out just to say that it's long and involved and is more than just getting permission to release something, but there is some, some experiments and things that need to be done on the back end to make sure that it is actually working the way you want it to. I wanna briefly talk about just how our research was impacted by the coronavirus. Um, so international travel has of course been discouraged and banned um, in many places. Um, travel sponsored by this university has been banned. So I, received an LT Jordan Fellowship, which is a fellowship here to do research in um, non-United, non-US country. 
Um, so I was planning to go to China this summer to work on the Great Myrtle Bark Scale in China, look at the parasitoids in their native range, and unfortunately had to put that on hold. So I couldn't go to China this year. Additionally, um, our Chinese collaborators are still, um, as of this weekend, I reached out to Liu and just asked him what uh, things were like in China. And he was saying that people are still not encouraged to leave their home, so they can't really make any collections for us in Beijing. And then additionally, they can't really travel between cities. So any collections that we have cannot be made uh, on our behalf at this time. But that being said, we still need to do research. Uh, so uh, what I'd just like to point out is our future directions here. Um, we're going to continue doing the plant volatile collections and see um, how these plants, the Craig Myrtle plants from different cultivars and uh, different host plants of the Craig Myrtle bark scale how similar their chemical volatile profiles are, and that will give us some insight into how specific the wasp might be if it picks up on multiple kinds of profiles, and perhaps it's not as specific as if it only picked up on one kind of profile. Additionally, I'd like to do some honeydew assessment. So it's shown in the literature that honeydew producing insects produce different kinds of honeydew um, from different cultivars of plants and then ants who tend honeydew producing insects are actually attracted to different cultivars, um, honeydew from different cultivars in different ways. We wanted to see how those ants would impact natural enemies of the scale um, and make some predictions about how they would interact with those released, any released uh, insects, uh, excuse me, any released natural enemies. And then lastly, characterize any competition between competing herbivores. Kyle mentioned the great myrtle aphid. Um, we want to see how the crepe myrtle bark scale and the crepe myrtle aphid interact with each other. Does feeding from one um, impact negatively or positively feeding from the other? And how does this ultimately impact natural enemies? So with that, I just want to thank all of these fine folks, my committee, our network of volunteers, um, and our funding sources. And I want to thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, I'm going to uh, give uh, Dr. Held the, uh, the screen. And I also want to point out to the audience that uh, two other, uh, two more uh, uh, of our project, uh, you know, investigators are online. Uh, one is Gary, Dr. Gary Knox from uh, Florida. Would you raise your hand? And then uh, Dr. Yan Chen, who was co-presenting last week, uh, is in the background. She's not showing her uh, webcam. David, go ahead. And we have some questions. We're going to hold those questions to the end because all the panelists are going to be here. We'll answer those questions uh, at the end. Go ahead, David. All right. So, Kenneth and Kyle, thanks for that. Uh, those updates is really interesting work you're doing. Uh, so, what I want to talk about is really crepe myrtle bark scale insecticide applications and what we've learned about their impacts on beneficials. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about. If I can get my cursor moving, there we go. So as we know, we we have uh, collaborators on this part of the project through Texas A&M, of course, but also through um, the LSU Ag Center, and then through the USDA ARS location in Worcester, Ohio. Um, as we've already said, this work has been funded federally through the Specialty Crop Research Initiative uh, grant proposal. But also, I'll mention some of the work that's been funded locally through an Auburn University research, uh, undergraduate research fellowship program as well. So I want to acknowledge some of the other folks that have been involved. And what you um, can see here is our extension logo. I rely heavily on our REAs uh, to keep me updated on what's happening in different parts of the state. In Alabama, just for reference, we have severe populations. Uh, it, it's, it almost seems like every, uh, every couple of weeks I hear of a new outbreak or new infestation in North Alabama. And we also have populations in South Alabama with uh, very sparse uh, infestations in between. And that's where I really rely on our REAs. The picture you see here is the crew from my lab currently. Uh, most of them at some point in time have touched an infested crepe myrtle, infested with crepe myrtle bark scale. Um, and so I appreciate all of them, including some of the grad students, current and former, that have worked on this project. And then I also rely pretty heavily on two Alabama arborists, um, 
to give me updates on locations and what new things that they're finding that might be working or not working for crepe myrtle bark scale. So I really wanna talk about our three areas. And so the first one is what we do for treatment uh, for crepe myrtle bark scale, and then how that may provide various routes of exposure. If you're not familiar with what I mean by route of exposure, it's basically how perhaps a toxin could be delivered. And that has a pretty tremendous impact on um, how we assess the hazard. You know, everything has toxicity. You, you can even die from water, of course, from drowning or, or um, having too much water. But uh, it's really some of these routes of exposure. We don't really think about how, they're, how these insecticides might be delivered. More recently, we have thought about this relative to delivery in flowers. And of course, uh, some of you or maybe all of you are familiar with uh, the uh, concerns with delivery of insecticide residues through nectar and pollen that are tainted by certain insecticides. Uh, but I'll also mention some of the stuff with residues and honeydew. And then really just camp out on what are some of the concerns and are they really valid concerns? So let's just start for a second. Most of what we know about the control for crepe myrtle bark scales come from work in Texas, Louisiana. I've relied heavily on uh, Dr. Mike Merchant and, and all these others who were really uh, laid the groundwork uh, for what we know about using these uh, neonicotinoids, uh, basically soil applied neonicotinoids for control of crepe myrtle bark scale. Specifically two we're gonna focus on, and you'll hear more about are uh, formulations of dinatefuran, uh, Xylam or Safari, or imidacloprid in forms of Merit and Mallet. You may have heard those trade names. Uh, but basically, those are the two more common ones that are being used for controlling crepe myrtle bark scale. Now, they're applied to soil, usually in spring or fall, and this is pretty, pretty effective. Now, why are we applying to soil? Well, if you spray the foliage, you potentially put a toxic residue on the foliage that would impact all of those wonderful natural enemies that. Uh, uh, that Kyle talked about earlier, and we could see declines in those, which could then lead to outbreaks of um, of other insects in the canopy of crepe myrtle. So by putting that insecticide below the surface, we reduce that potential hazard. The tree can still take these materials up and deliver the toxic residue uh, to the bark scale. But some of the concerns here, are in ornamental horticulture, we have just really high use rates for some of these plant materials much higher use rates uh, simply because they're woody plants, larger plants than we see in all other areas of agriculture. And really the burning question is, could these products move from the soil through the vascular tissue in the plants into flowers where then uh, the beneficials that we rely on, uh, bees and natural enemies could potentially be exposed. One of the questions early on that we kept grappling with as a team first off is what is actually visiting crepe myrtle flowers? Is it really important? And we got mixed reviews on this. I mean, some people say, well, nothing really goes to crepe myrtle flowers. In fact, you can see in the literature that some people even consider crepe myrtle to be a poor uh, pollinator plant for bees. That's some of the work in Kentucky I'll mention in just a minute. But um, if I talk to my colleague here at Auburn that does bee work, he'll say that they see plenty of crepe myrtle pollen on bees that are coming back to their hives when crepe myrtle are in full flower. And so we get, we get this sort of mixed review about whether or not um, those flowers are providing something for bees that could inten intentionally harm them. So crepe myrtle, uh, one thing is important, a little botanical lesson that I didn't know until we started working on crepe myrtle bark scale and, and other things, that these are nectarless flowers that produce copious amounts of pollen. Um, and this pollen really is what's important for the pollinators and some of the natural enemies that visit these flowers. So in this very center there, you see what's called the food or reward pollen. Uh, that's, what, that's really what nectar does. Uh, nectar is a reward for things that are visiting flowers. It gives them a little you know, shot of energy. And then you get the real pollen that's actually used for, um, for seed production and reproduction in crepe myrtle along the outside edge of these flowers. Take a look at them. No, no doubt crepe myrtle is probably blooming near you somewhere, um, and you can definitely see the, the difference of these two pollens. Really kind of fun to look at. So what I want to talk about is some of what we know about crepe myrtle as a resource for pollinators. So there have been three published studies I can find in the literature, um, the one of which is the landscape study I referred to uh, that was published out of a, group, a research group out of Kentucky. Um, and then we have two really nice cultivar evaluations, one by Dr. Gary Knox and um, Dr. Russ Mizell out of Florida, and then uh, Dr. Brayman's lab out of uh, Georgia, 
who looked at what were some of the, the bee complexes across these different uh, cultivars of crepe myrtle, trying to answer this question as to what really visits them and are they important, simply because that, that experiment in Kentucky was really um, casting dispersions on whether or not crepe myrtle was a valid plant for pollinators. Most of us are looking for plants that pollinators can use and benefit from that we can put into the landscape. And, and in this case, that study, which was done really at the northernmost extent of the, the range of crepe myrtle, uh, was kind of saying it, it's really not that important. So what are we looking at that are visiting these flowers from the published work? Well, we know we have what we would call the larger bees. This would be um, the Western or European honeybee, which is apis, bumblebees and carpenter bees. Those are the ones I've highlighted there. Uh, but then there's also sweat bees and some other bees that are visiting um, these flowers that you can find. Now, all that published work suggests that there are definitely preferred cultivars for these, for these pollinators. And most of us uh, that assume that crepe myrtle is probably providing some uh, pollen when there probably isn't much else that's blooming out there. Uh, it's simply because we have such large floral displays, large trees uh, putting out so much pollen uh, that can be a resource for these bees. So we wanted to do some work in the landscape in Auburn. We use the exact same methods done in so many of these other papers where we look at snapshot counts. And then here's Amanda doing some selective netting as she's standing on, the, on this, one of the signs outside one of the research labs on campus. And we basically just net them. Um, and then we basically were looking at, at what was visiting flowers in the landscape, more typically where we would expect crepe myrtle, not at the northern extent of the range. And pretty much we see what everybody else was seeing, that it's largely uh, bees that are showing up. More than 85% of our floral visitors, we don't like to call them pollinators because I don't know if these bees are actually functioning in the uh, ecological role in terms of pollinating crepe myrtle. But, uh, so, but more than 85% of the flower visits were um, apis, which is what we think of as the honeybee, sweat bees, and then bumblebees. Uh, coming to these flowers. So yes, indeed, we're seeing plenty of bees that are attracted to these trees, and we tend to see more abundance of them in more urbanized areas, which would be equivalent in Alabama to downtown Birmingham, downtown Huntsville, downtown Mobile, versus uh, places more like the suburbs. One other thing that we looked at that wasn't considered in some of those other papers were, what about hoverflies? Now, those of you who don't know what a hoverfly is, these are serpents to the bug nerds, and and the adults are bee mimics, really cool. Everyone likes to photograph them because they're so interesting. But the important part there is that the, the larvae are predatory. And if you ever turn over a leaf that has an aphid infestation and you see these creatures that look like they're, you know, something out of a sci-fi movie um, eating the aphids, those are um, what we would call hoverfly or serpent fly larvae that are really important predators of things like aphids. And possibly even some of the, uh, we just don't know what, what else they're eating potentially on crepe myrtle. But these are also flower visitors, and that can be important as well. They could potentially be impacted. So what we wanted to do is just ask, do, do these systemic insecticides that we apply, imidacloprid or dinotefuron, move into pollen to impact all these uh, flower visitors that we now know that are there? So we used three timings that uh, were pretty standard based on what we'd already seen from the past research in Texas and Louisiana. We had a fall application. And then we had two spring applications, one that was before bud break and one was after we had uh, leaf flush on these trees, but before flowering. All right, so those are our timings and all these were soil applied as I mentioned earlier. So the idea then was we bring flowers from those trees into the lab, harvest the pollen and then send it off for evaluation. So there's a lot of data here. Let's look at um, in the, the top three uh, rows underneath the heading, that's the emitic, those are the imidacloprid data for fall and the two spring applications. One thing I'll point out here, and this I'll carry these data over to the following slides, is fall applied imidacloprid seems to have um, way more uh, active ingredient in the pollen than spring applied imidacloprid. And it may just do with the rate at which imidacloprid moves into the plant. Um, fall applied xylam was really sporadically um, or dinotefuron was really sporadically detected. We had one detection out of our three samples that we took and it was relatively high. Not really even sure what to do with that one. Um, out of the three samples that we had for spring uh, pre-bud break, only two of those resulted in, in any detectable um, amount of dinotefuron. 
and then basically we had detection of dinotefiron in all the spring applications made um, after leaf flush. We need to put this into perspective though, because those numbers that are parts per billion really mean nothing unless we put it in context of the bee biology. And so what you can do is you can go into the literature and look at um, bee foraging rates and ask, so what's the hazard of these levels to bees that are coming to flowers? And so they call this, you know, kind of a hazard quotient. And that's sort of what I'm presenting to you now. So if we take this, the parts per billion level here and put it in context of a contact or oral exposure. Contact would be what happens as the bees are handling the pollen, as they're gathering it. You know, bees are gathering pollen out of these flowers. And then what happens as it's ingested? And so we can ask that is a, what percent of the LD50, now let me pause again here, LD50 is lethal dose to kill 50% of the test individuals. It's very common to use that metric in toxicology work as sort of a benchmark for, um, it's not LD90 here, it's LD50 value, but uh, basically that whatever that dose, dose was, it killed 50% of the test animals, or in this case, bees in the experiment. And you can see that um, if we look at percents of those doses, that fall applied to metacloprid, which had higher levels, would give you know, roughly 40, 46% of the um, lethal dose in each daily exposure, and roughly you know, 10, 12% in the, um, in those spring applied. If we put that in terms of how many days would it take bees to forage on these trees, I think that's probably a more concrete variable to think about. Um, basically for the fall applied it, in, in less than two and a half days, they would reach the LD50 value and uh, eight to 10 days foraging on trees that are spring applied for a metacloprid. The exact same setup for the dinotefuron data, except I discounted the fall data simply because we only had one detection in a tree. Uh, but did calculate the exact same metrics for um, the spring applications. And so in spring, uh, the, the, those applied pre-bud break had higher levels, therefore they're getting more of a dose or percent of their LD50, and that's basically 1.3 to two days of foraging on those trees would help them or get them to reach that value. And then um, basically 22 to 32% of the LD50 values uh, with daily exposure and roughly you know, three to five days uh, for them to reach that LD50 value. So not very uh, long exposures for if these bees are constantly foraging on these trees where they'd potentially be exposed. In this, again, this is the year right after those uh, trees would have been treated. So it'd been like fall 2019, harvest them in 2020. But in this case, it was fall 2018, harvesting them in 2019. Want to briefly go to another route of exposure um, that I mentioned earlier. So flowers are the primary one everyone thinks about, but crape myrtle bar scale produces a lot of this honeydew. And um, and uh, Kenneth talked about measuring. I thought it was really cool, Kenneth. By the way, talked about all that honeydew on different cultivars. That's this really really cool science. But if you look at the infested tree, the trunks are usually very shiny. Um, as there's just, they, these scales just produce copious amounts of the sugary excrement, and they're you know natural enemies and ants and stuff everywhere. And if that develops, then on top of that, you'll get the development of these fungi, these sooty mold fungi that grow on top of that, tend to make the trees look very dark in the landscape. The the bark and branches look very dark, um, help you to actually see some of the scales on the plant because they provide a better contrast. But uh, but that's typically the way it, they appear in the landscape. So why were we thinking about honeydew and sooty mold? Well, there have been some uh, papers that are almost released or that have been released that suggest that some of these systemic materials can move into honeydew or even into um, the fungi, uh, like sooty mold fungi. And um, as Kyle pointed out earlier, um, there actually is um, a genus of lady beetles associated with crepe myrtles that he's found that are interestingly um, uh, mycophagous. Basically, they're eating powdery mildew and some of these other fungi that are growing. It could potentially be exposed. This is just a really new area we're in. This is where my student, uh, undergraduate student, Elijah Carroll, is working right now. So what we're doing is we've got two basic questions to start. We want to know, is the honeydew another route of exposure? Um, but we need to know when is honeydew produced? Is it produced all the time from these trees? Um, 
I don't know. So we put out honeydew collectors and we want to basically determine the seasonality of honeydew production. And then uh, we're going to actually ask if that honeydew contains imidacloprid. And if so, at what levels? Is it a level that would be toxic um, to a bee if they forage on it? We're also asking what actually forages on honeydew on these trees as well. So this is some of the things Elijah's, uh, and hopefully uh, in the next webinar or something else, uh, another meeting or something, I can share the results of what Elijah's gonna find out from these experiments. So again, crit myrtle bark scale relies on these systemic insecticides. We already know that pollen is a, is a delivery mechanism potentially exposing um, uh, bees primarily, but also potentially some of the other beneficials um, to toxic levels of, of these insecticides that are in the pollen. Again, no nectar in this. Um, so if those are important things, we're still working on this, taking data again from this next year. and. Uh, now as panelists, we'll take questions, but there's my contact information. If you need to reach me, you can follow me on Twitter or have my email address. Hey, David, so you're, you. David you're one of those uh, social entomologists, you know, not like Kevin and his group. They're not that social. <laughs> <laughs> I um, guess I am. I'm semi-social. Semi-social. Like, yeah. Okay. All right, Kyle. Well, thank you, uh, Kenneth. Uh, thank you for all your uh, presentation. This has been a, a lot of uh, information. This is really cool. Uh, now let's uh, look at some of the questions from the audience. 